Okay. If you find task difficult, try to discover, discuss with your classmates, okay? I'll give you two minutes for discussion, okay? Okay, so can you identify the key terms? Can you, can you identify the key terms used in this study? So the first key term you identified is Sorry, just examine the title. So which are the key terms? Contextualized study. Yes? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. What, what, what others? Actually, I highlighted all the key terms for you already. <laughs> Did you notice that? So a contextualized study, framework, learner approach, and degree of success. Okay, so can you, without referring to the slides, can you just 
Okay, focus on the slide here. Okay, can you can you can you imagine? Can you, can you predict what kind of literature view section will be covered? So these are the keywords, right? Using this study, so the author actually organized literature review in four sections. Okay, all right. Yes. So learner approach, contextualized study, degree of success framework. So for learner approach, this is uh, the first, uh, the section of literature review. Uh, the, uh, the, the subheading is language learning and vocabulary learning strategies. This is learner approach, right? Because the title is vocabulary, right? So you only need to review, you have to focus on vocabulary learning strategies, right? Okay, you, you can cover briefly language learning strategies and then you have to focus more on vocabulary learning strategies, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Contextualized study, contextual, contextual influence on strategy use. Uh, the author talking about, for example, like cultural background, learning environment, language pedagogy, and language assessment format. So all these can influence how students uh, choose what strategies to use, okay? And then degree of success, uh, the subheading, uh, this uh, part is strategy use and the language achievement. So in this uh, uh, part, the author reviewed the empirical studies which investigated the relationship between uh, students' uh, uh, strategy use and language achievement. So usually, you know, you, they use kind of a survey study. They survey students, okay, what kind of strategy use, and then they collect the language, uh, you know, uh, testing scores and try to see whether, you know, uh, you know the, uh, the score uh, of the vocabulary, uh, uh, for example, like a uh, survey can be correlated with the language achievement. So basically this kind of study actually are kind of uh, uh, quantitative, okay? Yeah, because this study is also quantitative, <laughs> okay, right? Okay, and framework, well, uh, uh, to justify, for example, uh, you know, uh, the work, the author actually, with, which is me, okay, I introduced a new framework, okay, I, I, I kind of, uh, but my framework actually is based on, on others' work, I think it's based on uh, the book uh, written by Oxford Rebecca, Rebecca Oxford, okay, not, okay. Uh, in 2011, she wrote a book on language strategy use, and in this book, she tried to differentiate strategies and tactics. So strategies are general, and tactics are more specific. So based on her definition, I created my own framework. Okay, and actually, you're going to study this framework in session eight of the Lexis Morphology course. <laughs> I will show you what my framework is okay, in, that, in that course, in, in session eight, okay. So based on the framework, I designed my questionnaire, vocabulary learning uh, strategy uh, questionnaire, okay. And I, 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 I give it to uh, three, more than 300 Chinese university students and I collect data, okay. And, and also I measure the vocabulary knowledge. <laughs> Okay, all right. But I, I think uh, I use cluster analysis, which is a little bit complicated. Okay, it's a kind of a statistical uh, method, cluster. So in this research, I classified uh, uh, learners into five types, based on what kind of strategy use, and also based on the language achievement. Okay, if you're interested, you can read this book, uh, read this article. I already provided a reference. Okay, but anyway. Okay, so. Oh, well, but one thing I would like to say is not all the authors are like me. They would put all the key terms in a title, right, for convenience. Sometimes, you know, uh, authors, they want to use a, like eye-catching eye title, right, <laughs> okay? You know, just like when you are selling some product, right, you have to have eye-catching slogan, uh, 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 something like that, right, okay? Uh, but I'm a kind of traditional, you know, so when I work on my title, I try to make sure, you know, my title actually, uh, uh, by reading my title, you know, readers can know what I'm going to focus in my study, okay? <laughs> right. So key features of good review. So the first is what? Do you still remember? 
you have to yes you have to be focused and you have to be selective right and what you're going to review should be relevant to your research topic okay so this one okay now the second feature this review has to, uh, you know has to be organized and it should be uh, thematically organized I don't know whether you uh, you have noticed that when you read literature review, do you often, for example, even on the key term literature review, do you see sub some subheadings? Yes, so, some subheadings, right? Okay, so each subheading actually is a kind of a part of literature review, and maybe they are connected with each other to some extent, right? Okay, for experts, you know, you don't need these subheadings; they know how to write. Okay. So sometimes, you know, uh, for those you know big scholars, maybe they, they can write uh, actually to review without any subheadings. But uh, because uh, they are very skillful, so and all the ideas are very clear. But for novice researchers, you know, uh, I especially I strongly recommend you to use subheadings to structure your rich review. You know, okay, this will be helpful. Okay, okay, even for example, some sentences are not very coherently written because. You have a uh, clear subheadings. People still understood the main idea of your section, right? So this is very useful. So I would strongly recommend you to use themes, themes or subheadings. Okay, so subheading actually is kind of your theme, uh, the themes you have uh, identified. Okay. Well, the thing is, you know, you have to when you when you organize your themes, you cannot just summarize all those findings, you know, uh, one by one, by producing a, a long list. This is not interesting, right? Like in a video, you know, you, you don't produce a laundry list, right? <laughs> okay, you don't you don't review, for example, like this author, okay, blah blah blah. Uh, okay, in her in his research, blah blah blah, you describe the findings, and in the second paragraph. You mention a new author. <laughs> you just you summarize uh, the the work. It's not very interesting, right? Uh, this actually you can do at the preliminary stage, right? For you to understand what author has done, each author ha has done. But this is not enough. And afterwards, when you get this key information or this little summaries you you did for each article, you can try to see what connections you know among these uh, research studies and how can you reorganize information by creating by creating some new information, you know, okay? And this is your thing, right? Okay. So avoid a uh, chronological listing of papers, as this can lead to repetition and make it difficult readers to extract the main themes, right? Actually, you know, English writing is a kind of a write, writer responsible language. Do you understand what it means? Particularly in academic writing, it's a readers, a writers, uh, you know, uh, uh, responsibility to make everything clear, make everything explicit. You don't even make people guess. It's not, it's, it's not different from writing a novel, right? In novel, you can maybe uh, foreshadow, you know, and then you you can uh, give some hint, and later you review the result, right? Okay. But in academic writing, you have to be very clear, very explicit. Okay, <laughs> right. But you have to, otherwise, you see. You have to follow the structure of doing, uh, you know, academic writing, so people know where to find and loca uh, locate information quickly, right? Otherwise, you know, if you have to read the whole thing in order to find something, it's very time-consuming, right? You don't have time, you know, for producing a research article. You have to view maybe th thirty or forty papers at least. Okay, so for f uh, later, I will show you how I deal with readings. Okay, okay. So the second feature is what. What? Yeah, try to have some organizational pattern, or try to use some themes to organize a literature review, right? Okay, that's the second. The third. Oh. Literature review combines both what and what. Summary and what. Summary you summarize what other people have, uh, what other people have done, right? But this is not enough, right? Okay. Remember, you also, you have to contribute your own ideas, right? How do you contribute your own ideas? 
S summary, summary, okay, and next you have to maybe try to reshuffle the ideas, right? And try to reorganize the ideas. How do we call this? Things, yeah, synthesis. Synthesis, okay. Or think that, uh, the verb is synthesize. Okay, this is very important, okay? You don't just summarize other people's work. You have to synthesize others' work, right? Okay, by synthesize others' work, you're kind of contributing your own ideas, right? Okay, that means you use your own line of thinking to organize the research findings we have so far. You're, you're in, in this way, you are, you are a construct of story of research, or line of research, right? So, you know, summary is different. It just recaptures the key information. You know, the important information of those sources. Uh, synthesis is a reorganization, a reshuffling of that information in a way that informs how you're planning to investigate a research problem, right? Now, how can you synthesize others' ideas? Well, you may give a new interpretation of old material or combine new with old interpretations, right? Even, for example, introduce some uh, uh, old framework, but this is a very famous work, work okay? Well, uh, you can maybe try to modify it, right? In one way, right? Okay? So you give a new interpretation of the material, or you can look at this model from a, a new, angle, new angle, new perspective. You know, you often research, you have to see which area you are from traditional second language acquisition, or maybe more broadly education. You know, even education you have a lot of fields, right? Many, many fields, okay? So you can try to maybe uh, interpret a model, uh, originally maybe from second language acquisition, from maybe uh, the, from, from the psychology point of view, right? You give a new interpretation, right? You add some new information to it. Or you can, uh, Trace intellectual progression of the field, including major debates. So you can maybe give our readers, uh, you know, a kind of a comprehensive view of what, uh, you know, uh, happened in this field, and you also try to summarize the major debates, okay, and give a, uh, so people will see your uh, well, what has you know a rich consensus, what you know people are still arguing, right? Then you kind of prepare space for your own research. So why do you need to include debates? Basically, you kind of justify your research. Well, we haven't reached consensus uh, about a particular topic, right? So it's, there's still space for you to, uh, to do your research. So you do not always include positive uh, reviews, right? Okay, say, so, well, well, in this field, you know, lots of work, lots of achievement, okay? So why do you need to do your work? <laughs> okay, so you have to indicate the problems, the base, not only the achievement, right? Okay. Uh, you also need to evaluate critically the sources. For example, you know, even, you know, uh, you, well, the author may be claimed in this study, you know, uh, the findings are very positive. Well, you can still maybe evaluate critically. Maybe you, you see that the author ignored something, right? Maybe uh, the, the author only, for example, like uh, tried out maybe this, tried to uh, base his work, for example, like <coughs> his method is effective, but only uh, the participants, for example, maybe only university students, right? He never tried maybe his, his framework with uh, secondary school students or even, even younger learners, right? Okay. So you, 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 you can try to, uh, you know, even, you, it's difficult for you to find some big faults. You can find some small faults, right? <laughs> okay. And then you make space for your own research. Or often I think it's a case when you try to do a replication study, right? For example, like you base your own study on some very successful study, but that study is entirely maybe on a Western culture, for example, okay? They, I mean, uh, they use that model, okay? For example, only for American students, uh, maybe this model has never been applied to uh, uh, Chinese students, right? Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a small gaps you can find. Okay? 
So actually, by doing this, okay, you're contributing your your little small ideas, right, to the field, okay, right. But of course, you can be very creative, okay. Uh, you can make a maybe a big contribution, okay. It is possible, right? Okay, it is possible, right? Okay. So the set, the third key feature is what. This review combines both summary and synthesis. synthesis. That's right, synthesis, okay. Now, uh, the next one is very easy. The research gap should arise from literature review. Do you agree? Yes. So why do we need to do literature review? Basically, you know, towards the end, you're kind to show, you, you give a summary, okay? You can summarize, okay, you know, Summarize uh, and then you propose your topic on research question, right? There's kind of indicate research gap explicitly. What hasn't what hasn't been done or what what has been ignored or overlooked in the past. Okay. So where do we usually find research gap? Do you remember? Also, perhaps towards the end of this review, right? Yeah, towards the end of this review, right? I will just show you one example, okay. Um, so basically, you do a literature review because you would like to identify certain limitations of previous research, right? Okay, and you have to make these limitations explicit. Remember, English writing is a, reader, a writer responsible language. You have to indicate everything very explicitly, okay? It's very different from Chinese writing, traditional, okay? You don't need to be explicit, right? But in English writing, you have to be very explicit. Uh, or you might, for example, identify areas that have not been fully studied or not studied at all, okay? I'm just giving one example, okay? In my research article, for example, like in this article, in this article, Appendix 1, which you have a red introduction, and at the end of my introduction, did you find a word? Yeah, introduction. You can see the introduction. Uh, one, one sentence is highlighted for you towards the end. You see that? So, uh, so I cite others' work, <laughs> okay? Because these two people actually, they are kind of experts in the field of like language learning strategy, okay? So I cite these experts' work, okay? So point out, blah, blah, blah. Uh, language learning uh, strategy research is still quite a immature field and go on to call for continuous efforts to address the problems and the issues in this field. Based on the comment though, so this, so, so well, this uh, I identify the gap, but actually they already identify, right? I simply, you know, I, I borrow the words, right, <laughs> okay, to make this uh, gap explicit. And then afterwards I'm going to propose my research, okay? So it can be, uh, you know, research gap, uh, you know, can be, uh, often you can, it also will give you some hint at introduction. And also later more explicitly pointed out at the end of the review, okay? As introduction is also a big part of the review, right? Other ways of indicating the gap? Are you interested in knowing <laughs> other ways of it? So please do this task, okay? After this talk, you can uh, take a break. Now read uh, extracts from Appendix 2 from different articles and underline the place where the research gap is indicated, okay? So, uh, so Appendix 2, Appendix 2, okay? So I give you uh, just a three shorter paragraphs, okay? So each, each, uh, each paragraph actually is uh, from, uh, selected from a different article, okay? Right, so please read Appendix 2, okay? Read extracts from the uh, three articles and underline the place where you think the research gap is identified, okay? okay.
you can work individually and later you can discuss with classmates, okay? You're quiet. <laughs> okay. Did you finish it? Do you find it di difficult or easy? Easy. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right. So no need to discuss. Okay. All right. And now you now you can check your answer. Okay. So for the first article. Despite the blah, 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 you see? Empirical cross-cultural research about Mo is still scant. So remember this, right? Like some work is scant or scarce, or there's a dearth of something, right? Blah, blah, blah. You, so you have to notice this key uh, sentence structure. So this actually alert our research gap, OK? So pay attention to this kind of research phrases and structure, OK? So, uh, have you got right? Yes? yes. Okay, all right, good. And the second one's here, is it okay? Okay. So you see, blah, 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 on the country to the passion, blah, 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 the exploration of more uh, cell phone learning, right? You mean cell phone, right? Uh, EFL teaching is insufficient and hard to locate in China. Okay, all right. And the last one, what is lacking, right, is a much more detailed picture with a support. I think this is from my article. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, all right, yeah. So you have to pay attention to these key phrases okay, and the structure to identify the research gap. And also l try to learn to indicate your research gap with such, you know, uh, lexical or uh, syntactical construction, okay? Right. Okay, so let's take a 10 minute break, okay? All right? Okay. Ten minute break.